um, there were two images in the title. So one was the rainbow feathered gowns. The second one was the twirling barbarians. So we're getting, the second part of the talk now is going to be the twirling barbarians part of the talk. <laughs> um, so we want to step back for a second and think about Tang Dynasty China and why it was such an intercultural, some even call it cosmopolitan um, time. Part of it had to do with the fact that China's political territory actually reached further out into Central Asia, specifically um, towards the west, but also towards the south into what is today Southeast Asia, um, and reaching out also into what is today Korea and Japan in terms of the regular interactions that were going on with different parts of the world. Um, and I'm going to be focusing mostly on the interconnections between Tang China and um, these different kingdoms in Central Asia that contributed a lot to Tang Dynasty music and dance at this time. Um, and as you can see from the map here, so this is a map of the Tang Dynasty at its height in 750, so right before that rebellion, um, right around the time that Yang Guifei and Tang Xuanzong were, um, were having their love affair. Um, the Tang actually expanded westward through the Silk Road into what is today um, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, uh, Kazakhstan, and also Xinjiang, um, the northwestern part of China. And so you see in the upper left corner um, something called Sogdiana on the map. So that's going to be an important part of the talk. Um, the, the, the barbarian um, actually refers to Sogdians in this context. Um, but you can also see it's not too far from the South Asian subcontinent. Um, it's also part of the Turkish world, broadly speaking. Um, you can see Turkestan um, up there. The Uyghur Empire is um, rising at this time. And then, of course, also the Mongolian steppe um, is an important cultural factor here. Um, but this actually was not entirely new. So we know that during the Han Dynasty, um, several hundred years earlier, there had also been um, expansion into the same territory, into Central Asia. And so if you look at the Han, Han Dynasty reaching out into almost as far west, but not quite, uh, mainly into what is today Xinjiang. Um, and we know that there was a period of disunity between the Han Dynasty on the one hand and the Tang Dynasty on the other. So the Han and the Tang are both considered to be relatively unified, large, powerful Chinese dynasties. Um, but this period of disunity in between these two major unified Chinese dynasties was actually very important for thinking about the cosmopolitanism and the cultural mixing that ultimately became so important to the Tang Dynasty. And one of the reasons for that um, is that many of these these um, groups, these cultural groups from Central Asia were able, and also from um, what is now Mongolia, actually were able to gain more and more uh, ground moving southward into what had historically been considered Central China. And so during the period of division, for example, um, even as early as the late, Tang, the late Han Dynasty in the 150s, um, the Central Asian groups had made increasing territorial gains. So, for example, the Xiongnu, which was a very powerful group at the time um, from the northern areas, moved steadily inward. The Xianbei also were very, um, very powerful Turkic nomads um, who eventually were able to take over and establish their own kingdoms. Um, so the Wei dynasty, actually my, Ch my Chinese name is Wei Meiling, and my last name Wei is the same character as this, um, this country Wei, so I have an affinity for it. Um, they were actually um, established by one of these Turkic groups, and so what happened during this time was that you had groups that were moving in, and in some cases they would be um, actually Turkic speakers or speakers of Iranian languages, but they would adopt certain aspects of um, Chinese writing or um, costumes or other types of Chinese culture. And then you'd also have it in the reverse, where the Chinese groups would adopt some of aspects of um, their uh, decor, design, music. Um, we, we talked earlier about the pipa, that instrument, the lute, um, really became a big part of Chinese music um, during this time period. So you had the exchange going in both directions. Um, and so there was actually um, a scholar who said that by the year 168, there was almost no year in which there wasn't some kind of major invasion coming from these nomads um, from the Central Asian area. 
So by the time the Tang Dynasty sort of reunited a lot of these places, um, if you look at the map, you know, they reincorporated a lot of areas that had really been taken over by these nomadic groups from the Central Asia, but then they got reincorporated into the Tang. So a lot of that um, cultural influence was already there, and the Tang just inherited it. Um, but in addition to that, the, the Tang rulers, many of them really op were very, what now people consider to be open-minded about their ability and their interest in absorbing and learning from these other cultural groups. And so many of the Tang emperors did explicitly incorporate um, music and dance styles that were specifically associated with groups like India, um, places like Korea, um, places like um, these different groups like Sugdiana, they would incorporate them into the official music and dance of the Tang Dynasty court explicitly um, and, and see it as something that added to the court tradition that they were proud of. So during this time, in terms of cultural geography, um, a couple of concepts become very important. So one concept is this idea of the Western regions, or the Xiyu. And this, very broadly speaking, refers to everything from what is now India to Central Asia, even up um, into um, the Mongolian area. So any of these kind of nomadic groups that were pressing in, Tibet might be considered part of this notion. So it's, it's an idea that's really important in the Chinese worldview because it's constantly coming up. People are constantly going there. For example, Xuanzang, the famous monk, um, he has to go to the Western regions to get the Buddhist texts, which by this point are very, very important to Chinese culture. Um, people are constantly going there, people are constantly coming from the Western regions into China, but at the same time, they're not quite considered to be part of China itself. So they're there, but they're not quite, um, they're still considered to be outside, which is why sometimes the word barbarian is used to convey the sense of uh, negative stereotypes that some um, Tang writers had towards people from the Western regions. Um, but then in contrast to the Western regions, you have this idea of the central plains, or the Zhongyuan, which basically refers to the far southeast part that sort of was always either part of the Han or part of these various kingdoms that was considered to be relatively continuously part of um, what people consider to be the central heartland of Chinese culture or Han culture. But there's a constant push and pull and relationship between these two places that helps to define um, how people describe these different cultural forms and where they come from um, once they get into the Tang Dynasty. So right before the Tang unification, there was a very short but very important dynastic um, period called the Sui. The Sui actually established several important um, music bureaus, and we have to keep in mind when we see music, we also have to include dance. So these music and dance bureaus, um, where they started to organize these different musical styles into official court um, performance forms. And the Tang actually um, inherited most of what the Sui had established and just added to it. So it was very central foundation for what the Tang ultimately um, saw as its own. <clears throat> And so Wang Kefen, this famous Chinese historian that I referenced earlier, she says that actually it was during the Sui, um, there's an important transformation. She says it was the first time in Chinese history that the music and dance art of the various ethnic groups and regions were distributed on an equal basis into the court banquet music. It was no longer like in previous dynasties when the music and dance of minorities or foreign places were regarded together as music of the four barbarian tribes. So if we look at um, this first, um, they're called books, but really they refer to the entire compositions and sort of structures of these different um, performance forms. So originally in the Sui um, court structure, there were seven important court uh, music books. Um, and if you look at where they referred to in terms of the different places in Asia, you can see that actually a large number of them were from regions that wouldn't have been, been considered part of that central plains heartland of Han culture. Um, so the first two, the national, Guo or Xiliang, um, was a combination of the western regions and the central plains. Um, the Qingshang was considered to be really from the, the, the Han culture. Um, but then you have the Gaoli, which is um, associated with the kingdoms that would now be part of modern day uh, North or South Korea, or maybe possibly Northeast China, where there are large Korean populations. Um, Tianzhu referred at the time to India, what's now India. Um, and then you had 
a, a whole section that was focused on Central Asia, a whole section, Qiuci, um, which was the Kucha Kingdom in modern day Xinjiang, um, and then you had the Wenkang as well. Um, the nine books added two additional ones onto these, so you got two more that were also part of the Central Asian region. One was Sagdiana, Kangguo, um, and the other was Shule, which is um, an area of Xinjiang around um, the city of Kashgar today. When you get to the Tang Dynasty, <clears throat> You have one added um, to complete the, the Tang Dynasty 10 uh, royal um, court music and dance structure. And that last one is from the Turfan region. And I'll show you a map in just a few minutes so you can see where a lot of these are located. Um, but I just want you to notice that among these 10 Tang Dynasty court and music um, structures, there are really only two that would be considered to be really conservatively speaking um, from that Central Plains culture of Han um, culture. All the rest are actually coming from these other parts of the Tang Kingdom or even outside the Tang Dynasty, um, but places that are having constant exchange, such as Korea and India, with the Tang. Um, <clears throat> And the other thing to notice is the really large number of the books here that are coming specifically from either Xinjiang or Central Asia. So if you look at the map here, you can see, it's, I know it's a bit blurry, but the green circle to the far right is the kingdom of Kucha, or Qiuci, which was one of where the books was, um, the music was coming from that region. The one in the middle is Shule, and then the one um, on the left is Sogdiana, just to give you an idea of where these are in relation to um, the rest of Tang China. Um, and you can also see some of the other groups, um, such as the Tibetans and the Turks, that are um, very close by here. And if you look at the Silk Road roots, you can see definitely that this exchange was very much integrated with the, the cultural and economic trade and um, trade of people moving back and forth across the Silk Road. So Turfan was a very important Silk Road city, um, as was Kashgar, which you can see on the map. <clears throat> and the Sagdiana region is where you see on the map Samarkand and Bukhara, um, which are both part of modern day Uzbekistan. Um, so a couple of people had asked about earlier about how, how these exchanges actually happen. So there are many different ways that they happen. One way that they happen is that traders actually moved into the Tang um, through Silk Road Exchange. But also the expansion of the military, um, of the Tang military during this period would often entail certain diplomatic exchanges. So if a certain territory was taken over, the Tang might actually require a certain number of people from that kingdom to move into the Tang capital as a way of ensuring that there's gonna be an ongoing relationship. Um, and it, it could even be people of a high level such as um, a prince or, or, or a princess that would be taken almost as a guarantee um, of the military victory. So there are many different ways that people move during this time. People would also be given, women would sometimes be given in marriage as a type of diplomatic act. P performers would sometimes be given um, as gifts um, to sort of be seen as ways of establishing good relationships between groups. So there are a wide variety of ways that people moved. Um, before we get to this musical instrument point, the other point I wanted to make is the importance of Buddhism at this time as a very important cultural glue that actually was facilitating a lot of these exchanges between the Tang Dynasty and Central Asia. So we know that Buddhism originated in India, right? So any time um, a major monk um, or a translator would be somehow bringing aspects of Buddhism, whether it's texts or visual artworks or architecture, into China, um, somehow that would be going through India. So that's why India had such a big role in a lot of these exchanges. Um, okay, so one of the things we see that's a result of these changes are these new instruments. And so the pipa, which is the instrument that you can see um, being played by the two um, figures in the front row, that's an instrument that we know came from um, Persia. Um, it, it adapted on its way across the Silk Road and it ultimately became an important part of Chinese music during this time period. Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned earlier, we start to see the, the, the body lines um, adapting to some of these Indian postures such as the, the Sandal Wan or the three curve shape. Um, but then we also see new dance styles that are specifically identified as foreign dances. So the one that I want to focus on today is what's known as the Hu style. And the Hu 
The who here, we'll talk about in just a minute, it referred specifically to people from Central Asia. Um, sometimes it referred to people from, with Persian or Iranian ancestry. Sometimes it referred to just any nomadic group from the Northwest areas. Um, <clears throat> but you can see in the images, they look very different from the depictions of the other Tang Dynasty dancers that we looked at. So first of all, both of these images appear to be men. And as a couple of people pointed out in the Q&A earlier, pretty much all of the images that we had seen prior to this were, were female. So this is one thing that distinguishes this who dance is that there are specific who dances that are performed by men as opposed to women. Um, you also notice the boots. So these uh, leather boots actually become a very important sort of iconic way of identifying the who figures. And, um, According to Wonka Fun, all of these um, five music bureaus that were taking inspiration from the Central Asia area, um, she, she says there's evidence that they all performed in these leather boots, actually. Um, and that's part of how you identified them as being stylistically from the Central Asian region. So you can see the boots here. You can also see um, oftentimes there's a belted part of the, the costume. And oftentimes the way that they describe the difference in the upper garment is that they have tight sleeves. So they would say, you know, it's a who dancer with boots, a belt, and tight sleeves. And that's how we can tell it's different from um, a Han Dynasty figure. Um, oftentimes you can also tell by the way the facial features are molded or depicted that they look, um, oftentimes they have larger noses, eyes that are more deeply set, and also hair that's somewhat curly. And these are all features that are used to identify who, um, who dancers in these images. So as I said, who can have different meanings in different contexts. So um, the, the famous historian of the Silk Road, um, who I'll, I'll reference later, she says that in the Dunhuang documents, the word who almost always has a connotation with Persia. Um, but she says that in the context of the who dances, it specifically refers to the Sogdians. So she actually translates um, the, the barbarian twirling dance as the Sogdian swirl. Um, so if we look back at, at Sogdiana again, you can see here it's the area that's the peach color on the map. Um, it stretches from modern-day Xinjiang um, all the way to parts of modern-day um, Afghanistan. So this is a woman whose name I couldn't remember just now, Valerie Hansen. So she has written one of the um, really authoritative and vivid descriptions of life on the Silk Road. And she puts a lot of emphasis on the importance of the Sogdians in um, Silk Road culture. She, she says that among the many contributors to Silk Road culture were the Sogdians, a people living in and around the great city of Samarkand in today's Uzbekistan. Trade between China and Sogdiana, their homeland, peaked between 500 and 800 CE. Most of the traders named in the excavated documents came from Samarkand or were descended from people who did. They spoke an Iranian language called Sogdian, and many observed the Zoroastrian teachings of the ancient Iranian teacher Zarathustra, who, who taught that telling the truth was the paramount virtue. Because of the unusual conditions of preservation in Xinjiang, more information about Sogdians and their beliefs survives in China than in their homeland. Um, in terms of the Sogdians living in China, she says that already in the early 4th century, um, this group of letters that was discovered that was written in Sogdian showed that Sogdian communities existed in Luoyang, Chang'an, Lanzhou, Wuwei, uh, Jiuquan, and Dunhuang. The second letter mentioned settlements of 40 Sogdians in one place and 100 free men from Samarkand in, in another. The Luoyang settlement included both Sogdians and Indians. As soon as a community of Sogdians reached a certain size, perhaps 40, they erected a fire temple. Um, the Saobao performed ritual functions, namely tending the fire altar and presiding over Zoroastrian festivals. And as headmen educated disputes in Iran, Zoroastrianism evolved toward monotheism um, with Ahura Mazda as the supreme deity, but in Sogdiana, its adherents worshiped many deities, including Ahura Mazda. So the Sogdians had their own written language, which uh, many documents do actually survive today that scholars such as she have used to try to understand Sogdian perspectives on these exchanges. Uh, so it's not always a one-sided looking at it from the Chinese view. 
Um, and there's also extensive visual art that the Sogdians um, have, have left behind in various museums and other documents that scholars have used, for example, to look at the spread of Buddhism and other religions throughout this region. Um, but the importance of Sogdians is very um, central for our concerns when thinking about Tang Dynasty culture. Um, and that's for two reasons. The first one has to do with economics. So according to Hansen, by the 6th and 7th centuries, Sogdiana had become the richest country in Central Asia. So that's the first reason. The second reason has to do with the perceptions of Sogdians um, in these different Chinese cities. So the most prominent migrant community in Western China was by by far was the Sogdians, whose homeland was in Samarkand and the surrounding towns of modern Uzbekistan. They formed settlements in almost every Chinese town where Sogdian Sabo headmen supervised the affairs of the local community. Some Sogdian migrants were merchants. They appear so often in fiction that the stereotype of the rich Sogdian merchant took shape. So they had a cultural um, importance in addition to their economic importance and also their importance as people who are living as migrants in these Chinese communities. Um, and many of them, you know, became Tang citizens themselves. And so we shouldn't necessarily even consider them to be migrants, but just met one of the many communities that makes up the Tang dynasty at this time. Um, so we do have a, an item in the collection here that could potentially be representing a Sogdian merchant. It's not clear. The description um, in the museum catalog says Central Asian wine peddler. But given what we know about the importance and the number of Sogdians, it's possible that it could be someone from that community. Um, so the Hu dances were actually two of the most popular dances in, during the Tang Dynasty, and some of them even um, were already being practiced in China during the period of division, um, and so continued to be popular in the Tang Dynasty. And again, we can look to poetry to actually see some descriptions of what these dances might have looked like. Um, so let's take a look at this poem here that's about the, the, the first of the two, the Sogdian Prance. Hu Tang. So Tang is a word that can mean leap, it can mean gallop. Basically, it's some kind of energetic fast movement where you feet, your feet leave the ground. Um, that was one type of popular Hu dance. The other one that was extremely popular was the Hu Xuan Wu, which means the turning. Um, so the swirl or the twirl, um, that's the basic movement. Um, so the descriptions of the prancing um, dance, here's one example. And this was a dance that was specifically performed by men. The dancer from Tashkent appears young. He dances to the music before the wine goblet, as rapid as a bird. He wears a cloth cap of foreign make, empty and pointed at the top. His Sogdian robe of fine felt has tight sleeves. The body leaps, gyrating as on an axle. The, beju the jeweled belt jangles. The feet move in rapid motion. The embroidered boots are soft. Wildly jumping on the new carpet of pure white and crimson wool, it appears as if some light flowers have spilled over a red candle. Um, and here's a slightly longer description, but it gives us some more vivid descriptions of the movements. Um, so the poet writes, the Hutung dancing boy comes from Liangzhou. His skin is as white as jade, and his nose is straight and pointed. He folds a linen shirt and a wine-shaped streamer around his waist. He kneels down and murmurs in his Sogdian tone, ready to dance for the Chinese officials. The Anxi mayor watches with tears. The Luoyang poet writes a song for him. Stamping his foot on a carpet, he moves his eyebrows, dancing with a leaping hat and, a s and sweating in red. Getting drunk and leaning to the east and west, he jumps all around the lamp in soft boots. In melody, he rapidly moves and whirls. Hands on waist, he makes a humpback like a crescent. In the end, the string instrument is played. The bugle horn sounds loud from the garrison. Hutung boy, Hutung boy, do you know the route to your hometown has been cut off? So we can get some images from these pictures. We can picture the hands on the hips, the eyebrows moving, the humpback. We can imagine um, the jumping, the stamping, um, the twirling. So a different kind of dynamic from what we imagined before with the, the Tang dances um, that we talked about last time. Let's see if there's anything else I'm missing here. Um, the leaping. So the feet are definitely leaving the ground here. There's stamping involved as well. Um, so there are documents of this hutung dance in China dating back uh, to the 6th century. So here's one example. You can see on the center of this uh, vessel, there's a man standing. Um, <clears throat> he's doing this kind of an action, I guess. And he's looking back behind him as he stamps his foot. 
Um, here's another example. You can't really see the feet, but in other images I've seen, he's wearing red boots. Um, and so you can see actually some similarities with the upper body actions that we saw with the tongue movements here. Um, but the hand on the hip is something we hadn't seen before. Here you have also um, images that are on vessels, so they're a little bit harder to see, but I put some sketches that artists have done. Um, and so you can see a lot, there's a lot of the feet one foot lifted, so people think that there is a lot of stomping involved in this dance, or at least some kind of kicking. Um, and then with the swirling ones, we see definitely that there's turning that's evoked by these swirling streamers. So you can see the way the streamer is going around the body, that the body must have turned to create that kind of coiling action. Um, and another image from Dunhuang that people have identified potentially as um, the Sogdian swirl is um, this one, where you can definitely see the extreme movements with the ribbons. Um, you can see that they're dancing on a carpet, which was something that was described in the poem just now. Um, it's hard to see exactly what um, is happening with the arms here, but it seems that the arms are out to the sides, moving the, the fabric around. Um, so within the categorization of dance styles in the Tang Dynasty, there were actually two major styles. One is the Jianwu, which is translated sometimes as vigorous, strong, energetic, um, and it was contrasted with the Ranwu, or soft, dances. Um, so both of the Hu dances, as you can probably guess, fit into the category of the energetic, strong, um, sort of vigorous dances um, within that framework. And so you can see here, they're both um, in that category on the left. Um, and so we do have some um, items in the collection here that seem to be depicting um, what looks like possibly the Hu Tong dance, if we match it to the descriptions and the other images. Um, so this one here is from the collection, and you can see um, the movement here, actually, there, there is a movement that's performed in Xinjiang dance today in which the person goes up on the, the balls of their feet. I don't want to ruin my boots, so I'm not going to do it. But <laughs> they, they bring their feet up onto, onto their toes. And, um, and also, at the same time, you can see that it seems like they're, this kind of action is suggested uh, by the image. And here's another one that's a very similar position, um, also in the collection here, to give you a sense of the, the use of the shoulders um, and the use of the feet um, in opposition. So now we have another contemporary example of a, a, a TV drama from 1990 that's actually depicting um, a different Tang emperor, slightly earlier than the Tang Xuanzong, um, and one of his consorts performing the Hu dances. So let's see how it's depicted. So I want you to listen to the music and pay attention to what different musical instruments you hear. Look at the costume and then, of course, look at the movements and see if it seems to depict any of what we just uh, read about. <laughs> Sorry that it's somewhat blurry. So when I'm watching this dance, what I'm seeing a lot of is actually the influence of a very famous Uzbek dancer from the early 20th century, who I think um, is probably the basis for at least the, the woman's um, choreography in this piece. And 
Tamara Kanum was actually Armenian ethnically, but she lived in Tashkent and she established um, one of the first professional theatrical ensembles in which women performed on stage without any kind of head covering. And so she was considered to be, I mean, she did wear head coverings, but not the traditional kind that women would wear um, in this society. By this point, Central Asia is no longer Zoroastrian. By this point, Central Asia is Muslim. She was considered to be actually very um, radical for bringing women on stage. And she became a major figure in the Soviet Union who represented Uzbek dance in the 20th century. One of her students, um, a Uyghur woman by the name of Kangbar Han, was born in Kashgar, studied in Tashkent with Tamara Khanim's school, performed in Tashkent as a professional dancer, went to Moscow and then came back and actually was the main founder of Xinjiang dance, what became known as Xinjiang dance or Uyghur and Kazakh dance forms in um, the People's Republic of China. And you can see, I think, um, some continuities between this and um, the depiction of the Sogdian dance of the Tang Dynasty that we just saw. So it's interesting how in the contemporary choreography we see people reading the sources of the Sogdian dances through these contemporary choreographies by Uyghur um, and Central Asian dancers who were developing you know, newer traditions that still existed within those regions. Um, and I want to show you two examples of Uzbek dance that are performed today in um, China and in Taiwan. So this is um, a dancer from the Xinjiang Art University who um, actually won China's So You Think You Can Dance television show a couple years ago. And one of her winning dances that she performed was an Uzbek dance. Okay, and then the last example is um, uh, a Taiwanese performance uh, based on the Huxuan uh, concept. So you can see here the um, recreation of the, the twirling ribbon dances that we saw earlier. Okay, um, I think we're almost out of time. I'll just show you really quickly. We wanted to talk a little bit about how Tang Dynasty dance impacted dance in Korea and Japan. Um, unfortunately, we won't have time for that today, but actually this is one of the topics that's been written about the most in English, so there's plenty of places to look if you are interested in this. Um, and then, of course, Japanese court dance has been probably the most written about topic in English, so there's plenty available to look at um, gagaku, bugaku, um, and there are a number of items from the museum here. So I just want to quickly note the lion dance is one of the most lasting and visible um, dances that was part of this era um, that people think came either from India, Central Asia, or China into Japan, and it, it continued to be part of Japanese and Korean dance up until the present day. Um, we have images of Japanese court dance in the museum that come from this time period, and then also these beautiful um, scrolls. And then lastly, I'll just show you very quickly an example of the Lanling Wang Bugaku Japanese court dance that is still performed in temples in Japan today.
Thank you, everyone.